The setting sun cast long shadows on the tense battlefield as armies clashed, cannons roared, and the soldiers charged with bayonets gleaming. Muskets thundered, blood soaked the soil, and cavalry galloped amidst the chaos. The clash of steel, gunfire, and agonized cries depicted a vivid and gruesome spectacle. The death here had made the Civil War a stark reality for both factions. This is the first battle of Bull Run. On July 21st, 1861, the first battle of Bull Run, also known as the Battle of Manassas, emerged as the first major bloody battle of the American Civil War. On this day, the stage was set for a larger than life confrontation between the Union and the Confederacy, where destiny awaited its dramatic unveiling. Irvin McDowell, propelled by connections, ascended three grades to the coveted rank of Brigadier General in the United States Army. He was tapped to command what later became known as the Army of Northeastern Virginia for the Union, with forces consisting of 35,000 men arranged into five divisions. On the Confederate side, Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard, who had previously served in the U.S. Army, commanded the Confederate Army of the Potomac. Alongside Beauregard, Brigadier General Joseph E. Johnston, also a United States Army veteran, commanded the Army of the Shenandoah. Overall, both the Union and the Confederate armies at the First Battle of Bull Run were composed of a diverse mix of soldiers with varying levels of training and experience. This battle would serve as a learning experience for both sides, highlighting the need for better training and organization as the war progressed. Fueled by political pressures and with the weight of history bearing down upon him, Union Brigadier General Irvin McDowell was forced to unleash his offensive campaign prematurely. The battlefield stretched ahead, a vast canvas awaiting his command amidst the whispers of fate, setting the stage for a clash of titans. On July 16, 1861, at 2.30 a.m., the mightiest army North America had ever seen embarked on a monumental march from the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Its destination? The hallowed grounds of Manassas Junction, 30 miles to the southwest. But why would the Union attack Manassas and not march towards Richmond? Manassas Junction was a strategic railroad junction vital for the Confederate supply lines. Capturing it would disrupt their communication and their supply routes, weakening their position in the region. Additionally, controlling the junction would give the Union greater mobility and flexibility in their operations in Virginia. At 6 a.m., as the sun began to rise, the leading column of McDowell's army, under the command of Brigadier General Daniel Tyler of the 1st Division, finally advanced towards the vicinity of the Stone Bridge. The Stone Bridge was strategically important as it controlled a crucial crossing point over the Bull Run Creek impacting troop movements and supply routes for both Confederate and Union forces. Union Brigadier General William Tecumseh Sherman's brigade took position on the northern side of the pike, while Brigadier General Robert C. Schenck and his men maneuvered to the south. Brigadier General Erasmus D. Keyes held the position on the turnpike, situated further back, ready to act as a reserve force. Initiating the battle, Tyler directed the 30-pounder Parrot rifle and the accompanying artillery to unleash their might across Bull Run. As the time passed and the eerie silence broken only by Union artillery, Tyler, sensing Confederate inaction, ordered skirmishers to advance into the battle. At 7 a.m., amidst thunderous artillery near the Stone Bridge, Confederate General Johnston swiftly directed Brigadier Generals Barnard B., Francis Bartow, and Thomas Stonewall Jackson to maneuver towards the Confederate left flank at Stone Bridge, ready to reinforce at a moment's notice. By 8 a.m., Johnston and Beauregard strategically positioned themselves for their impending flank assault at Centerville. They aimed to strike at the heart of the Union headquarters, disrupting command and potentially cutting off communication and retreat lines. From a Confederate signal outpost, Captain E. Porter Alexander witnessed distant bayonets, signaling advancing Union forces led by Colonels David Hunter and Samuel Heinzelman. With eagle eyes, he relayed the sightings to Colonel Nathan G. Evans and General Johnston promptly. Recognizing the urgency, Evans expedited his command's movement from the Stone Bridge to Matthews Hill, intercepting the Union flank march. Matthews Hill, a crucial vantage point, became a pivotal defensive position amidst the chaos. Meanwhile, Johnston pressed on with his assault on Centerville. At 10.30 a.m., Colonel Ambrose E. Burnside's brigade clashed with Confederate forces on Matthews Hill, officially beginning the battle. The valiant brigades under Confederates B. and Bartow swiftly advanced to Matthews Hill to bolster the Confederate forces. 
The battle was in full force by 11.30 in the morning, with Colonel William T. Sherman's and Colonel Erasmus Key's brigades successfully crossing Bull Run, just north of the Stone Bridge. While Sherman's brigades advanced towards Matthews Hill, Colonel Keyes, accompanied by Tyler, directed their movements to Young's Branch, positioned east of the Stone House. Young's Branch, a small stream running parallel to Sudley Springs Road, served as a natural obstacle influencing troop movement. Meanwhile, Colonel William B. Franklin and Colonel Orlando B. Wilcox's brigades, belonging to Heintzelman's division, had reached Matthews Hill, with Colonel Oliver Howard's brigade closely trailing behind. Confronted with the looming threat of being outflanked, the Confederates were compelled to retreat from Matthews Hill, regrouping on Henry Hill. Much like Matthews Hill, Henry Hill provided advantageous elevated terrain and a crucial command infrastructure for whichever side held it during the battle. At the same time though, the renowned Hampton Legion reached the vicinity of the Robinson House on Henry Hill, strengthening the Confederate fortifications. Upon hearing the escalating gunfire from the left flank, Johnston abandoned Beauregard's original attack plan and hastily rode towards Henry Hill, with Beauregard following closely behind. By noon, Jackson's 2,600-man brigade had arrived at Henry Hill, strengthening the Confederate position in readiness for an impending Union onslaught. With Confederate reinforcements pouring onto Henry Hill and McDowell's troops regrouping on Matthews Hill, Tyler stood poised to reignite the conflict. After crossing Bull Run, Tyler instructed Key's brigade to take up position along Young's branch and, without consulting McDowell, ordered Keyes to initiate an assault on Henry Hill near the Robinson House. The Robinson House, strategically positioned on Henry Hill, served dual purposes for the Confederate forces during the engagement, functioning as both a defensive stronghold and a rallying point. At 1 p.m., Keyes dispatched troops across the turnpike and into the yard of the Robinson House. The Hampton Legion retreated, and Keyes' regiments quickly encountered Jackson's 5th Virginia Infantry. For nearly 20 minutes, the two sides exchanged gunfire, with the Virginians reinforced by the Hampton Legion shooting from the wood line, while the Maine and Connecticut regiments held their ground in the open area around the Robinson House. Keyes and his army ultimately retreated to the area near the Stone Bridge. This retreat weakened the Union position on the battlefield and allowed Confederate forces to gain momentum and potentially pursue a counterattack. Moreover, it caused confusion and disarray among Union ranks, furthering disorder and ultimately contributing to their untimely defeat. At 2 p.m., following nearly two hours of Union success on Matthews Hill, McDowell finally ordered a forward movement. But rather than a full-scale advance, he swiftly directed Major William F. Barry to relocate Griffin and Ricketts' batteries to Henry Hill. Griffin's artillery swiftly entered a fierce duel from a strategic position north of Henry House, a focal point of intense fighting and strategic positioning for both sides on Henry Hill. Amidst escalating conflict, Griffin relocated two guns southward, but they were swiftly captured by the Confederates. However, the capture of these guns was short-lived. The Union counterattacked, swiftly driving back the Confederate forces and reclaiming Griffin's section and forcing a retreat. Reacting swiftly, Jackson deployed additional Confederate forces to bolster the weakening line, including reinforcements from B's brigade. The focal point of the battle shifted to the Union guns on Henry Hill, changing hands multiple times in the midst of the fierce battle. Confederate General Beauregard personally led Confederate forces in an assault to reclaim the guns, resulting in heavy casualties on both sides. Rather than launching coordinated assaults, Union General McDowell deployed his forces incrementally, wasting his numerical superiority in enabling the Confederates to bolster their positions effectively. At 3 p.m., Howard charged toward Chin Ridge, while Sherman orchestrated a strategic array along the Manassas Sudley Road. Chin Ridge held vital strategic importance, serving as a key defensive position for Confederate forces. With lightning assaults, Union forces engaged in intense battles near the Henry House. But despite initial success, Confederate reinforcements turned the tide, reclaiming control of Henry Hill. Sherman's battered brigade and others retreated as dusk fell, marking the shifting fortunes of war. As the clock struck 4 p.m., with the Union threat waning on Henry Hill, Confederate attention swiftly turned to Chin Ridge, where Howard's brigade had positioned itself. Fresh Confederate troops bolstered their ranks. They unleashed a barrage of long-range fire upon Howard's men, forcing them to engage in a fierce exchange. Despite Howard's best efforts to rally his regiments, relentless pressure from Confederate forces led to the eventual break and retreat of his command towards the turnpike. By 5 p.m., McDowell witnessed the disintegration of his army as troops scattered in different directions, deserting the battlefield for Centerville. 
McDowell tirelessly traversed the field, endeavoring to muster regiments and individual soldiers, yet many had reached their breaking point and were reluctant to press on. In the midst of battle chaos, Union troops, overwhelmed by panic, fled the battlefield. Despite McDowell's gallant efforts to inspire his forces, the retreat gained momentum as fear and uncertainty swept through the ranks. Initially orderly, the withdrawal descended into chaos upon reaching Bull Run Crossing, exacerbated by mismanagement and artillery fire-induced panic. In the frantic flight towards Centerville, soldiers abandoned weapons and equipment, resulting in numerous captures and the loss of valuable assets, including artillery pieces. Despite Confederate President Jefferson Davis's urging for further pursuit, Beauregard and Johnston exercised restraint. The aftermath of the battle exposed leadership deficiencies on both sides, impacting morale and prompting a reassessment of military readiness. While the Confederate victory was undeniable, its opportunities in pursuing retreating Union forces underscored the prolonged and challenging nature of the war. This battle's repercussions reached beyond domestic borders, influencing foreign perceptions and inflicting significant casualties, marking a critical juncture in the conflict's course.